So here's the thing. So all of those things, weight gain, um, water retention, anxiety, depression, insomnia, these are not just side effects of the drugs. Because remember, these drugs mimic cortisol. So think about it this way. If those drugs can cause those, all those symptoms, which you, you experienced firsthand, they're horrible, the exact same symptoms can be caused just by living a stressful lifestyle. Because and you know it's what? the same hormone. Well, hi, everybody. This is Diane Gilman, formerly known as the Queen of Jeans, but now the proud host of my own podcast, Too Young to Be Old. And speaking of Too Young to Be Old, I want to introduce our guest, Christian Yordanoff, who wrote an incredible book, although it's only volume one of many to follow, How to Actually Live Longer. Who isn't interested in that, Christian? My gosh. Well, no. we certainly are, Diane. Oh, Thank we you for certainly me on. are. That's for sure, because I'm about to hit 79. And I do want to say I have pondered what makes people age and why do we all age so differently. But one thing I do see, because I study this area as much as possible, only 25% of the aging factor is genetic. The other 75% is environmental, including mm -hmm. stress. What What is your feeling about that? Totally. Um, I think... I think it may even be uh, less than 25% wow. genetic-wise. It may be. It may, it may be as low as 10%. Uh, you know, so, so I've heard some researchers say it could be as low as 2%. Um, yeah. It's literally what we do day in, day out that is either... I always like to frame it this way. Every meal you have, or rather, even more granularly, every decision you make takes you in one or two directions towards better health, more optimal health, or towards more, you know, dysfunction, degeneration, illness. So uh, I like to tell people, think about the meal you feed yourself. Let, let's say every meal you eat, it, it can be organic, it can be single ingredient foods, w ideally wild caught, pastured, this kind of stuff. Or it can be processed, glorified slop, and you know no. you can you can easily see if you only eat that, it will take you in the one direction. If you only eat the organic stuff, it will take you in the right direction. Or you know, I was just saying uh, because we always talk before we go into a podcast that I ate some meat for the first time in months and months. I was just lazy. I don't know what was on my brain, but it was kind of like, eh, I can do it. And I have a real yen for it. And wow, it it was not a good decision. That is not going to happen anytime soon. And I really do try and stay away from processed foods. But yeah. when we talk about environmental factors for aging, I'm thinking processed foods. I'm thinking sedentary lifestyle, which I'm really guilty of. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of pollution. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of drinking alcohol and oh, yeah. also not getting enough sleep. Yeah. But one thing I would add to that, and it was one of the reasons why I did walk away from fashion after 50 years mm -hmm. to try something new, podcasting, was stress factor. How much do you think stress actually affects at a cellular level and ages us? Well, that, that, that's a brilliant question because I have a whole, really a whole chapter in the book where I outline what I call the three primary drivers of aging and dysfunction. And one of those three is stress. Uh-huh. And interestingly enough, the other one, so the other one is inflammation, the second one. And the third one is oxidative stress. So again, a, another type of stress, more physiological. And in, when you think about it, inflammation is also a stress on the body because oh, the body yeah. has, yeah, it, the body needs to muster up 
resources to deal with it. And when we are, which most of most humans now are not energetically nutrient uh, status wise they're not up to par so that means that whenever they're stressed whether that's psychological stress or the other two stresses i just mentioned inflammation or oxidative stress because we're not um you know ener energetically and nutrient status wise we're not up to par the body has to make trade-offs so how to deal with the inflammation i have to down regulate some other function yes right? so this is you know where we start getting wrinkles early age spots uh people some people have hair loss you know hair hair is one of the first things to go you, you see now people oh please in their... tell me about it yeah my hair yeah. is everything to me and when i lost it during breast cancer yeah, I had no idea at my age because that was uh, five years ago. Would I actually grow hair back? And yeah. the majority of it came back, but I yeah. have to take a lot of nutrients, a lot of vitamins like Nutrafol, mm -hmm. to uh, make that happen. In terms of inflammation, so many yeah, older yeah. people like me talk about arthritis, and I've got arthritis in a knee. And wow, the that thing of inflammation in a weight bearing joint is just mm -hmm. so stressful yeah. in itself that even if yeah. you're not having a stress laden day, you'll be stressed. Oh yeah, just by that symptom. Just having pain is stressful because very you, you're agitated and then your relationships get strained. I know, I know this because um, a few months after my daughter was born, I had a fairly serious in back injury putting her into the car seat and my wife also had a concurrent back injury from all her ballet career related injuries and the two of us that was a very difficult period where both of us were just constantly in pain and we yeah, had to use awful. these kind of belts and painkillers and so on so yeah yeah pain pain is a stress and here's another stress that um i already kind of alluded to so inflammation which has many you already named a bunch of sources of inflammation um when inflammation in the body goes up guess what also goes up the stress hormone cortisol because, i knew it i yeah. knew it yeah so but here's the thing so cortisol has an anti-inflammatory role in the body but Cortisol is very destructive to tissues, including <gasps> we we know muscle. Everybody knows it. It can break down your muscle if your you know if your cortisol is high. But it also breaks down because you said arthritis. It breaks down joints. It can break down the skin, uh, organs, anything, anything it attaches to, which is most cells in the body. It can signal for them to dismantle. So this is where we have actually wow. I have it in the book. Um, we have a bunch of different um, conditions. You know about glucocorticoids, I'm sure, which are the the um, the drugs, the anti-inflammatory drugs. These are cortisol mim mimicking drugs, right? So you, you know you have uh, arth uh, rheumatoid arthritis, or you have an autoimmune condition. If you go to the doctor, they usually give you a steroid or a glucocorticoid, right? Uh, no, so no, these, no, 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 no. So I, these, I, I had enough of steroids. Um, yeah. So you know about this, right? Chemo. Yeah. And the side effects of those steroids. Yeah, I I found were very dangerous. Huge water weight gain, um, a lot of mood altering. Which yep. in the case of getting chemo, they wanted you to be happier than sadder. I get yeah. that, but I think it honestly uh, kind of clouds up a, a better system of you know intention and purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm I'm a big one for. You've got a problem. Can you solve it naturally? So I had high blood pressure after chemo. Mm -hmm. I had um, a weight gain, which was all water weight, and I had 30 pounds mm -hmm. during chemo, and I took care of that. But I also had, and that was just bad eating, high cholesterol. So I'm getting all kinds of pressure. Okay, let, 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 me, let, me just, let, let me pause you there for a second, Diane. So here's the thing. So all of those things that you listed are known side effects of the steroid treatments, of the glucocorticoid yeah. treatments. Yeah. So it's not even the food. Independently of what you eat, glucocorticoid drugs 
can dysregulate your cholesterol or your lipids and they can raise your blood sugar because that's that's cortisol's role one of its primary roles is to raise your blood sugar wow. when there's a stress so you can deal with the emergency yeah so here's the thing so all of those things weight gain um water retention anxiety depression insomnia these are not just side effects of the drugs because remember these drugs mimic cortisol so think about it this way if those drugs can cause those, all those symptoms which you you experienced firsthand they're horrible the exact same symptoms can be caused just by living a stressful lifestyle and you know what same hormone i t i didn't want to take statins i did i don't want to get on drugs for the rest of my life yeah even though um the medical community says oh you're crazy statins are great and you won't have a heart attack because that's going to protect you uh, my belief is always where you think you're going to be protected you're going to expose some other part of yourself that's going to exactly. start to get destroyed. So exactly. I just did an experiment and said to the doctor, give me six months. Let me change my diet. Let me change my attitude. And you know what? Perfect blood pressure, no cholesterol, perfect cholesterol, mm -hmm. 30 pounds lost. Wow. And so I'm going to ask you if you feel that, drugs that are ordinarily prescribed during the march of time, you know, mm -hmm. as years go on and you start to see that your body is not regulating everything as automatically as it once did. Do you believe in self-care and changing diet, changing stress environment, or do you believe some of the drugs that are offered to us, and they're offered pretty strongly like Ozempic, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I have a bunch of friends mm. on Ozempic who do not need to lose that much weight, could have yeah. done it through better diet. Do you believe in the natural approach or a mixed approach of drugs yeah. and good behavior? So quick disclaimer for the listeners, I'm not a yeah. doctor. This is not medical advice. Always consult your physician exactly. before you change your diet, supplementation and exercise routine. Don't even think about changing absolutely anything talk to your doctor first but what i believe diane and it's a, it's a, it's actually another good question because i talk about so in the book it's a short book right you could read this book in a week and i by the way i think i sent you like five or seven copies of it so give Thank some you. to your close friends please um we, re we really need to educate them because you're asking questions here that if if a person gets this wrong by not doing their research and only listening to their medically trained professional that was trained by basically the pharmaceutical companies yeah they could, yeah they could make a really gr a terrible decision for their, their longevity so i talk about um statins i talk about why i personally will never take a statin and um what i will tell you right outright though is we do have some really good drugs there is some really good drugs out there unfortunately most of them are either highly extremely expensive uh, nobody prescribes them because they're old so they're not ma raking it in for the pharma companies um, or they're just boring so there's no research getting done but I oh, for example for? so so for example I'll tell you I take one um, it's a pharmaceutical I take almost every day called piracetam and that's a prescription thing, but I, I get it personally from, from a chemist. And um, this is really good for the brain. And um, ah. verb, verbal fluency before recording podcasts, before working with clients, it just, you can, you can, you, you do it for like a few months and then you take a break for a couple of weeks and you start stumbling over the words a little bit more and you're like, oh, I can see, I can see the difference. So it's a really good thing. It's very safe. <clears throat> Some people, I've been taking this thing for 20 years nonstop. They give it to people after strokes. My grandma was on it, you know, I after see. her strokes. So, well, what, things, so yeah. Christian, besides that, and of course, brain is the command center. What about weight maintenance? Because I don't feel, you know, I, it's unbelievable. I was just, you know, kind of, sort of complaining, uh, oh, the spare tire around my middle and everyone is like, Well, why don't you just take Ozempic? <laughs> and a friend of mine was offered Ozempic and got on it. 
And that friend is not that overweight, maybe 10 pounds overweight. But, yeah, he was saying, well, some days he just eats one thing of yogurt. Mm-hmm. Some oh. days he doesn't even eat because it takes away your appetite. And he doesn't. He's not a guy that's going to take um, supplements. How good can this stuff be that's, for you? That's really bad. All of those things that you just said are extremely deleterious for that person's health. Now, here's the, here's the problem again with most. For again, so all of these. By the way, all of these good drugs that we do have out there, they're not. The reason they're not used is precisely because they they don't necessarily give quick they don't treat a symptom okay. and they don't give quick relief so people like or rather uh the the system likes to do things where you you get quick symptomatic relief so something where you can lose weight quickly or get rid of the pain very quickly things like that right so or like cut something out like surgery stuff like that chemo blast blast the cancer but yeah. um this the I actually this is another topic i cover in the book is uh, significant weight loss, like if you lose weight quickly or a lot of weight, that's actually been associated with increased mortality. So higher incidence of death. And I talk about why in the book, one of the couple of the primary reasons you don't want to lose weight quickly is because we store a lot of the toxins that we accumulate, they accumulate in our fat. So if you lose a bunch of, let's say you lose, um, you know, 40 pounds, 50 pounds, and most of that is fat, not water. <clears throat> You're that's a lot of circulating toxins that most people don't have the detoxification capacities to handle. So there's a <sighs> yeah. So f- f- here's a quote from the book. Right, this is from a study. Uh, evidence suggests that the highest mortality rates occur in o- adults who either have lost weight or have gained excessive weight. The lowest mortality rates are generally associated with modest weight gain. So the people that gain a little bit of weight as they age tend to do the best again because fat is protective okay so this is totally against what i hear when i'm told that fat is the key to getting cancer again that sugar makes fat and that fat is is mortality driven And then I get totally confused because actually for my older body, coming up on 80 years old, I'm 79, but I'm cushioning myself with Mm -hmm. 80. So when 80 comes, it'll be like, oh, yeah, no big (laughs) deal. Um, I naturally, without any coaching, went on intermittent fasting Mm -hmm. because my stomach, I just can't take that much food in my system. I don't want to walk around with all that heaviness. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, and in everything you've studied, because I hear both sides of it, do you agree with intermittent fasting? Is it a good idea? Is it a better idea past a certain age? I mean, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. That's that's another good question because I have a whole chapter, basically one fifth of the book. I talk about why fasting is actually not good for longevity, and there's a few reasons, right? Um, not to say that you won't get benefits from fasting, but again, it's short-term benefits. We're, I'm talking about longevity here. You know, we want to live into a hundred plus, not you know whatever eighty. Because you're you're just at eighty, you certainly want to live a few extra decades. I'm sure. I have Diane. friends. I have a friend right now, Iris Apfel, a hundred <laughs> and three. Wow. And uh, yeah, absolute icon on social media called Amazing. the accidental icon. So I have a total belief in yeah. using these years really productively, and I think that's a huge motivator to wanting to live longer rather than looking at the years as empty and unproductive and endless. Yeah. But so you're telling me that, and here's my problem. So so let let, let me, let me explain why uh, I, someone like yourself, I don't believe should intermittent fast too long. Let's say 10 to 12 hours is is totally fine. Right. Which is, you know, if you eat dinner, let's say at eight, go to bed at 10, you wake up at six, you can have a light breakfast at eight. That's, you know, 
12 hours, that's more than enough. Let me explain now why. So it all goes back to what, what we were discussing at the beginning of the conversation. So it's all about how does the body continue to function when you're not eating. So yeah. when it's a short fast, some of some of the energy comes from the liver's glycogen stores where we store glucose. Um, but that only lasts, you know, a few hours. So after, let's say, you, let's say you go to bed, you've eaten four hours ago, four or five hours after you, your last meal, you're now, your cortisol is starting to, you know, increase. Your adrenaline will start to gradually increase. Stress hormones, glucagon, growth hormone, these things start to increase. And the longer you go without food, the more they have to increase and the more you're breaking down your body no. That not, not just, oh my so listen God. to listen to this. I I, I highly recommend re- reading the the chapter on on intermittent fasting in there. This is what I recommend: half an hour before bed, take some honey or some juice, something organic, maple syrup, something you like. Have like thirty, forty, fifty grams of that. That's a lot grams. of sugar. It's it's a lot of sugar, but your liver can accommodate some up to 100 grams. So let's say let, let's say you wake up in the morning. This I, I, I think it's even more important to do it in the morning, right? Because I do you've had it a long morning. fast. Yeah. yeah. So you wake up, the first thing or the first one of the first things should be get some get some clean carbohydrates into your body. So I not do. grains, not yeah. grains. Whole grain bread. No, not not no grains. I don't recommend grains, but if you like whole grains that's that's Manuka, okay. honey. Manuka is great. Seeds. And it's delicious. And I have okay. one slice of it. Okay. And that's breakfast. No protein. No eggs. Okay. Because of cholesterol. Okay. So, I will, by the way, the, the cholesterol discussion, I also discussed that in the book. That the whole thing is, is a red herring. The whole thing is just designed to sell us statins. Cholesterol, in fact, cholesterol in older adults, so above 75, the the higher cholesterol has been associated with less cancer, less infections, oh my increased God. Hi, higher, is, longer that lifespan. I'm torturing myself by not eating you, eggs. I you, love eggs. You should. Oh my God! You should eat as mo- as many eggs as you as you want. Oh. You should eat as many. Uh, by the way, another thing: it's actually a myth that dietary cholesterol actually affects your cholesterol levels. That is a myth. So uh, I would recommend with that breakfast or soon after or after you're having, why not have two, three, four eggs at least every second day because you're getting so many. You're getting B vitamins. You're getting obviously protein, but you're getting healthy fats. You're getting yeah. choline, which is so important. You know, you know more than 90% of Americans are not even getting enough choline in their diet. And what the is best choline? Source, exactly. It's actually a B vitamin. Exactly. So I want to tell you that <laughs> I think for America, because you don't live in America, you're lucky yeah. and you live in Europe. And So in America, we are stuck between absolutely meteoric rise in cancer. Now under 50, 75, 77, 78 percent rise. Wow! In can, oh yeah, scary. In cancer, not going in the right direction. But we are stuck between what you can glean from a book like yours, how to actually live longer, um, and what. Your GP, your general practitioner says, so I'm a general practitioner associated with a very prestigious New York hospital, Mount Sinai, that I use when when needed. But she is a doctor, I believe, almost living 20 years ago (laughs) with the golden rule. The golden rule is if you eat eggs, 
Oh, you're going to die younger because you're going to oh, die of cholesterol. That's 20, at least 20 years. Yeah. I, you know, so in the past, there's yeah. that golden rule, which they talk about for chemotherapy, too, and say, you know, in 10 years, they don't even think they're going to be using chemotherapy anymore. They realize yeah. it's like taking a baseball bat to a house mouse. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Right. A clobbering something exactly. that maybe doesn't need to be clobbered. It's a crime. They don't it's, it's offer a crime these, against humanity. These GPs doing. don't offer any good advice. Yeah. That isn't approved by their hospital, which is yeah. funding their office. So I asked one of them about using red light therapy on my knee and my mm -hmm. shoulder, and it was like, well, oh, yeah. I don't know. And I said, what do you mean you don't know? You're a joint doctor. That's all you do. Well, the bottom line was, Christian, they don't want to talk about it because they want to sell drugs. Look at this they... right here, Diane. Yeah, right I've, here. Got, I've got a device. <laughs> use it constantly. Yeah. And even though they say, the doctor says, well, I don't, I can't recommend that. I don't really know enough about yeah. it. B.S. Yeah, you know enough about it. It's just not going to make any money for you or you're terrified one person is going to use it wrong and then go. There's so much lawsuit activity amongst the medical community that I don't think personally you get the best advice because it's so channeled into. Yeah. Drug companies and how to make that money, how to not promote non drug mm -hmm. health. You know, she was actually, the GP was actually upset when I came back six months later and I'd solved my cholesterol problem and, and my weight problem. And yeah, because it, before I even walked in, she said, Oh, hi, it's you. Well, I already called in statins because there's no way you can take care of it. Yeah. And then it you was know, all taken care of. So to, to, how do you, as a layman, not someone like you who's studied it, how does somebody like me navigate all this confusion? Take yeah, statins, don't take statins, intermittent fasting, no intermittent fasting. I mean, like, I've got medical whiplash. I've got aging whiplash from all of this. <laughs> I tell you. I tell you, probably, and this is only, um, I'm saying this tongue in cheek, but probably you do the opposite of what they freaking recommend. Woo! I think that's, if you're really stuck, just do the opposite of what they tell you, what your government tells you, what your doctor, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Always, listeners, always follow your doctor's advice. Don't even think about changing your diet, supplementation, or lifestyle without talking to your doctor first, please. Very important. You know, that. I will tell you that we got this. Um, it came out on CNN last week, and my thoughts on it were not totally positive. But they said that the FDA is about to okay a revolutionary new drug that is a painkiller and will kill all different kinds of pain without being addictive and i thought yeah that's exactly what you said about oxycontin and now <laughs> we have this huge problem yeah. in the united states and so have you guys in europe heard anything about such a drug where we're going to obliterate pain with absolutely no side effects and yeah. no addiction no, but I, I would tell you, this is something that I, again, I'm not giving anybody any recommendations, but for the last maybe eight, nine months, I've been taking aspirin every single day, sometimes as much as four grams in wow. a day. And if I was, let's say, 65 or yeah. 80, I would be taking at least, you know, 500 milligrams of aspirin every single day. There's so many reasons. In, in in my next book, I'll have a whole chapter on it. But it lowers inflammation. It it obviously helps with, with minor aches and pains, which is great. You sleep better. It can actually inhibit cortisol production. 
has it it has a bunch of really good metabolic benefits wow the, I, listen i cannot speak highly enough the only problem is the aspirin you get like uh from the pharmacy it has a lot of crap in it talc and uh, excipients just Fiery if you can stuff. get what well, actually what i what i personally uh uh recommend to my clients is willow bark extract that you can get on iherb.com and this this is the original aspirin right this is willow bark and uh you can you can get the extract which is what i do now 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 uh foods is the the brand i use willow bark extract 15 percent salicylin and the salicylin turns into salicylic acid which is what aspirin is yes so this here's the the best part Check this out. So I, I have a whole chapter in the book about the, the dangers of polyunsaturated omega-6 fats and seed oils. But aspirin or this salicylic acid or this um, willow bark extract, it inhibits the enzyme that makes inflammatory molecules, mediators oh, from the omega-6s. So taking aspirin, I think, is such a... Not just for the, the you know the smarter doctors recommended for primary prevention. Um, small doses of it can thin the blood. Higher doses don't generally do that. But um, just it's a general general. Most people that have some type of dysfunction going on will feel better with aspirin, and it will do some benefit to the body. So just you, get it. You think it's better than taking a leave or Motrin or oh yeah, Motrin. all those. Although here's the thing, if you go online right now on Google and type in aspirin, you will get a bunch of news articles that oh now aspirin new study associated with more bleeding and yeah, how now horrible it is. Bad they cannot they cannot get re take it off the market because it's so prevalent. So they're smear campaigning it like they like to do with previous drugs that are out of patent. So again, I cannot recommend anything to anybody, but my, my I personally buy from a chemist in Germany, uh, in Europe here. I get just a pure powder, 99.9% pharmaceutical grade salicylic acid. I, I dissolve that in a little, but here's the thing, just quick disclaimer. You want to take, if you ever do do this, like which I'm not recommending, I'm just saying what I'm doing, I take it with vitamin K because vitamin K, most people don't get enough in their diet and um, it, it helps with clot, uh, blood clotting and clot formation and it's a clotting factor and so on. Okay. So you want to... So uh, I come up after this um, really fascinating session, I come up with two theories. Number one, if you do slow down, let's say you retire by 65. I didn't. I didn't even retire at 77. Yeah. Well, I retired for four and a half weeks and <laughs> was going insane and then started my <laughs> podcast and got happy again. Nice. But um, <laughs> I think that if you are older, anyone in the audience who's older and actually anybody who's much younger, it really pays to start researching. If you have a little bit of time, start seeing what you can do for yourself. You can always turn around and ask your GP about it. Um, but I think that we are straddling a period um, in our civilization where it's partly homeopathic and natural, partly Oh my God, they just developed the equipment to like my friend, um, for no reason at all, had a brain giant brain tumor, and oh, wow. they had the equipment to go up into his nose. It sounds terrible, I mean, probably was, uh, but it saved him. And do it all, wow. take it out robotically. Wow. So, yeah. So you've got those kind of advances. Diana, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but there is, um, there is one, I forgot the name of the drug. It's a ser serotonin antagonist. I was looking at it on Wikipedia or it's like Wikipedia page. This is it's a serotonin antagonist type drug, which is the opposite of what generally these uh, antidepressants nowadays they do. But this one was effective or it's being researched for um uh, neuroblasto neo neoblastoma or some, some type of brain tumor, brain cancer. So this goes back to what I was saying earlier. We have a, a lot of really good, a, a small, 
subset of really good drugs that have these kind of anti-cancer, anti-fibrotic effects. Yeah, but they're but never given to us. Exactly. They're never discussed. It was it's take, always... This one was taken off the market due to safety concerns, not disclosed See? what they were. And yet, I, <laughs> I was told that... Um, just wait 10 years and you'll start to see some pretty serious side effects come out of Ozempic. My feeling oh, yeah. is, and I wonder, because we really have to wrap it up, I could talk about this forever, that you, if you are looking for the latest drug company, quick fix, you're going to get it. But you are also, we. you probably don't have it in Europe, but in America on cable TV, I would say a good third of the commercials oh, are yeah. giant lawsuits against something people took. Wow. Like it wasn't aspirin and it wasn't Motrin. It was something else, but within that category that caused autism in children if you're mm. pregnant. Oh, acetaminophen woman was pregnant mm. she never had any of that information neither did the doctors so i think we're just sort of straddling two worlds a natural world with homeopathic solutions and a world of stepped up and speeded up uh results that in fact long term may not be great for you you know, I'm just a girl who wants to live longer and better. I'm so I want everybody to say goodbye to Christian Yordanoff, the book, and we'll show you where to get it. It'll all be in our graphics is how to actually live longer, which for an oldster like me, I'm very determined to read and get the benefits from. But for anybody who's younger, let me tell you what. Even with the, all the supposed improvements we have in the medical world and the scientific world, aging ain't easy. But when you have someone like Christian, it can be easier. And I'll go for that. Christian, thank you so much. Boy, I could have talked to you for like not 30 minutes, but more <laughs> like 30 years. Yeah. So, um, Thank you very, very much, and um, signing off. Thank you, Diane. It was a Bye. pleasure to be on with you. Thank you so much for listening to Too Young to Be Old podcast. The episode may be over, but the fun doesn't have to stop here. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at The Diane Gilman, or visit our website, thedianegilman.com. If you like the show, leave us a rating or a review and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. And until then, don't forget, age is just a number. Together, we'll prove that we are all too young to be old.